and let us all that we can to build a better future. From one war to another. From one ridiculous, horrific conflict to another ridiculous, horrific conflict. That's right. We're going we're gonna to be talking about America's former ex-girlfriend, Ukraine. <laughs> or is it at the political establishment and corporate media's ex-girlfriend? You know, the one who is now used to be the main chick, now reduced to a side chick. We're talking about Ukraine. And Glenn Greenwald. Uh, went on a, an interview with Tucker Carlson to talk about how Ukraine and how it was abandoned by the West and how this war was nothing more than a serious waste of time and how this will severely impact the Biden-Harris administration. So let's go ahead and enjoy it. And a huge shout out again to people like Tucker Carlson. I don't have to agree with him politically on all his points of views, but at least he's had thought-provoking interviews with people across the political spectrum. Don't tell that to Brooke Goldstein. She'll be easily triggered, though. So let's go ahead and pull up this interview. Uh, I only got about four minutes of it, but I think it's important that we see this full perspective of it. So let's go ahead and play this video. Again, shout out to Glenn Greenwald, award-winning journalist. Let's play it. Right from Americans. What's so terrifying to me, though, is that the right, the American political right, which really was for this kind of weird transformation that's happened over the past dozen years, has become the lone defenders of the First Amendment. They've abandoned that in the last month, like instantly. So I think you could say, you know, I strongly support Israel. I strongly dislike Hamas. I'm, I'm rooting. For, maybe I think we should commit troops to the region. I mean, whatever. You can have any view you want. However, American citizens have a right to express their opinion. Period. And that supersedes any other event in any other country. It's like that's a core right. And I don't hear many conservatives saying that. Uh, and so you sort of wonder, like, if they're not defending it, who will? I mean, there are people who have built their careers, Tucker, over the last five, six years, standing up and saying, we can't have cancel culture. We can't have censorship. College students aren't entitled to feeling. Thank you. Thank you. Look, we, we've seen a lot of people on the right who stand up and say, hey, they're against cancel culture and censorship. Now, I'm not right leaning. I'm I think I, I Willie Bragg. Sorry, but I think I identify myself as a dirtbag leftist. All right. I think I'm kind of like burnt out by electoral politics, especially with what I see coming in 2024. Um, but I believe in free speech. I believe in the First Amendment, and I'm against cancel culture. I could speak for my colleague Daniel. He's against cancel culture and censorship. You know, we here at Hard Lens Media have been consistent on that, being consistent. What I don't like is hypocrisy and people who are not going to be consistent. If you're for free speech, then say it. You're for free speech. But yet we see people who've made a career now all of a sudden saying, oh, no, censor these people. They shouldn't be allowed to speak. It's either you're for it or you're not. Now, of course, some of the pushback I get back saying when I say, hey, I'm for free speech, people say, well, what about what about all these vile hate speech people or these crazy conspiracy theorists people? Yeah, they exist in a world of seven billion people on this little planet called Earth. Yeah, they're going to exist. And here's my bias. I believe that the world is filled with good people. OK, and at the end of the day, I believe that good intelligent speech will overcome and defeat hate speech and those that are severely mentally ill but i will not say cancel or censor because that's opening up a pandora's box for everyone to be on the chopping block and hard lens media not once eight goddamn times we've been hit now, thankfully, because of you, our wonderful audience and our allies and in independent media across the political spectrum. I know what, what what a shock. Stood with us and we were able to defeat the censorship eight times. World heavyweight champions here. Let's play the rest of this video. Things of safety. We don't censor in order to protect people from views they find threatening, mocking the notion that minority groups are vulnerable and we have to censor in order to protect them. Turn on a dime and now become the leading voice of saying because American Jews feel unsafe, that's valid in a way that, say, claims from black people or LGBTs or Latinos aren't valid. And because of that, we need to censor. Fortunately, there have been some conservatives, influential ones who have been quite consistent. Candace Owens, for example, had a very public argument with Megyn Kelly in which she was saying, 
We're not the left. We don't get people fired for their political views. We don't believe in using the law to silence people. There have been uh, Vivek Ramaswamy on your show. He just wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal saying we're not going to defeat Hamas through censorship or cancel culture in the United States. And I think the biggest example and the most important one, which is fire.org, that became very popular among conservatives in the United States because they were defending the rights of free speech on campuses for conservative students at a time when the ACLU wouldn't, stood up and vehemently denounced Ron DeSantis for a grave direct attack on the First Amendment when he tried to ban a pro-Palestinian group on campus on the grounds that they're providing material support for Hamas, even though he doesn't claim they did anything other than express their views. And I think this is the point. You are allowed to stand up in the United States and say, I think the United States should bomb Iran into oblivion. I think we should turn Gaza into a parking lot. Lindsey Graham stands up every day and calls for violence of that kind, and he's protected by the First Amendment from doing so. You also, though, as an American, are allowed to stand up and say, I think Israel is at fault in this conflict because of the occupation and the blockade. I think that people in Palestine have a right to fight back. I think that violence is justified because Israel has become oppressive. You can think all those views are repulsive, but leave the question of what you think of those views to the side. No question, Americans have a right to express them. And there has been a concerted effort on the part of many conservatives, including many who have led the way in mocking claims of victimhood and and victimhood narratives by minority groups and the idea that people need to feel safe. They are now the ones turning around and saying, no, because of how dangerous this speech is, we need to ban it. We need to ban these protests. We need to ban student groups. We need to put people on no hire lists. The exact kind of tactics they spent five or six years up until a month ago aggressively denouncing. And it's very dispiriting, even though it's not surprising, to the minute that they have views that they find offensive to turn for them to watch them and turn around and use all the same theories to say, those views cannot be expressed. That is incredibly dangerous because in the future, when conservatives want to complain about the censorship regime that has been implemented, who will possibly take them seriously right. after we just watch them the minute there was an issue of great importance to them, which is Israel, turn around and call for censorship. Obviously, it's not a principle if the only time you defend free speech is when it comes to views you agree with. Anybody can do that. That's easy to do. That's worthless. The only real test of whether you believe in free speech is whether you defend the right to express the views you find most offensive. And a lot of conservatives, not all, are woefully failing that test. So let's talk about free speech, and let's also talk about another thing where not too long ago, if you were to talk about this on YouTube, oh, my goodness, that video was taken down or you were censored heavily. Let's talk about what's happening in the Ukraine. Let's talk about censorship. Let's talk about free speech. Let's talk about this little segment on Glenn Greenwald's show, System Update. Let's play it between Israel and Gaza broke out a month ago, it was clear that Western populations were becoming far less willing to fund Ukraine's hopeless war effort against Russia. A CNN poll in August found that a majority of Americans now oppose any further U.S. resources being used to fuel the war by sending it to Kiev, while a candidate won the prime ministership in Slovakia, a longtime ally of Ukraine, by running on a platform of cutting off all funds to the war. For those who wanted to see it, the writing was on the wall for Zelensky and the Ukrainians that the West was ready to abandon Ukraine in this war. But now the U.S. and the EU have a new shiny war to fund. This one in the Middle East, not. Oh, no. Uh Oh, if we were to break this down relationship wise, this is how the Ukraine got got ditched. So now 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 it's okay to criticize the war in Ukraine. Can't can't talk anything about Palestine or Israel, though. Ukraine, not now. Hey, hey, it's got it's got the thumbs up approval because the United States is is ditching out the old and getting in with the new, because that's just kind of how it is now. Hey, Ukraine, it's it's dealing with modern dating now. It's being left on red in Eastern Europe with a far more valued and politically potent ally than Zelensky and Kiev could ever hope to be. And everyone other than Zelensky has been strongly signaling, if not outright stating, that it's time to end this war and have Ukraine sue for peace. Multiple American news outlets long supportive of the war are now instead routinely publishing articles designed to prepare Americans and Ukrainians that the gravy train is coming to an end. Even President Zelensky in a speech today seemed to finally be accepting his fate 
as he pleaded with Americans to give him credit and loans. <laughs> it is kind of funny. That video was hilarious. Hey, look, man, just give me money. G give us credit. We're good for it, man. L look, just give me another fix. I promise, man, we're going to do this. We're going to do this sequel to the Counter-Strike called Counter-Strike 2. The Electric Boogaloo. It's going to be great. If America still wasn't willing to hand over more free money. All of this was as predictable as it is tragic. It was obvious when Joe Biden and the establishment wings of both parties in Washington united to make Ukraine's war America's war. It was obvious that this was how it would end. It was always the case that Ukraine would have to negotiate a peace deal with Russia, given that Russia is a much larger and more powerful country. The idea that Ukraine was going to win this war and expel Russia from its soil, let alone from Crimea as well, which they've held since 2014, was always a pipe dream. And Ukraine and Russia could have negotiated a peace deal 18 months ago. And in fact, both of those countries tried. Now, if you were to talk like this or you were to break it up on mainstream media, you were vilified. Because what we're seeing here, especially in the first video segment about free speech and sharing and giving different opinions. In the aftermath of the 2016 election where the liberals got panicked and started crying because Donald Trump beat Hill Dog. What did the liberal media, the corporate establishment media, what did the Democrats do? What did the establishment system as a whole do? It created a lie known as Russia Gate, making anything Russian bad guy. Trump being with Russia. Oh my God. Turned out all that was just fake news. It was a conspiracy theory. I know liberals. I know Rachel Maddow won't be able to buy her fifth home because that was her bread and butter. I know. I know everyone's living vicariously. The liberals who missed out on brunch for four years. Couldn't see that happen. I know. But the problem is because of that ridiculous, small-minded ideology of Russiagate and Trump and being anti-Russian, it led us to this horrific conflict in Ukraine. And so many people died for no reason. And what's the end result of it now? The end result of it was further censorship, people moving on and forgetting what caused it, and to the most epic failure of a leader. Somebody begging for money. This is 10 seconds of pure gold. We've seen people like this at the gas station. We've seen family members or friends or former friends act like this. People who are struggling. This is a guy who has realized that the story is over. Once man of the year, now a nobody. If you can't give us, can't give us some financial support, okay. Okay, please give us a credit and we will give you back money. Give us credit. We'll give you back money. Give us money. Money us now. Money me. Money me. But as many people have confirmed, including former Prime Minister Neftali Bennett and a former German Prime Minister as well, the U.S. intervened early on to block all negotiations because the real goal of the United States was never to defend Ukrainians in Ukraine, but rather to sacrifice them at the altar of their real goal, which was to use Ukrainians as pawns to weaken Russia, in large part because so many Democrats remain filled with hatred and rage toward Moscow due to their belief that it was Putin who helped Trump win and Hillary lose in 2016. So here we are almost two full years later after the Russian invasion. Russia now occupies and controls roughly 20 percent of Ukraine. Tens of thousands of young and not so young Ukrainian conscripts have been killed fighting in what was always a feudal, feudal war, at least tens of thousands. The U.S. has spent more than $100 billion of American taxpayer money to fuel and prolong this war. Those of us who stood up early and urged the diplomatic resolution were widely branded as Kremlin agents, sometimes put on official blacklists issued by Ukrainian government agencies, including Ukrainian intelligence. And let's see, a lot of people have been put on lists or blacklisted or censored. Uh, the media went on a war pass against anyone that was critical of the war in Ukraine, or is it at critical now of the war between Israel and Palestine? You now, let's face it. A lot of independent media networks have wrongly been censored and hit. INN, Indie News Network, got hit. Revolutionary Blackout Network got hit. Do Dissidents got hit. Harlan's Media, The Jimmy Dore Show. Russell Brand has been attacked. Joe Rogan's been attacked. Glenn Greenwald, The Gray Zone. 
anyone that stepped outside the system, anyone that decided to be critical of what's been going on these past years like with the political establishment system, corporate media, etc., has been vilified and turned into a bad guy, the villain. It doesn't work. And people are waking up to the fact that this has all been one big waste, especially this horrific war in Ukraine. So many people died for no reason. It all could have been avoided. It was stupid and a waste of time. And so, again, I'm going to quote him. I'm going to quote Donald Trump. Probably the only reasonable uh, mind in a room when it comes down to this war in Ukraine. Broke it down simple. I just want people to stop dying. I want people to stop dying. Now, I don't know how authentic Trump is with those words, but my goodness, when Trump comes off as being more reasonable than Nikki Haley, that's not her name, or Lindsey Graham Cracker, or any one of the Democratic politicians like Nancy Pelosi, you, you know you have problems. And here we have, yet again, a U.S. CIA war that was utterly pointless, that did nothing to benefit the American people, except those who work in the arms industry or the U.S. security state, and that resulted in mass bloodshed and a waste of American resources. I'd like to say that Washington should learn a lesson from this, but the reality is, is that this was what... Hey, let's have democracy in the chat. I know, controversial statement. What's democracy? Type one if you think Washington, D.C. has learned its lesson. Kit, you got to have faith that the people in power know what they're doing. You've been too critical, and you're just a bully. Type two, man, they haven't learned nothing. Why'd you even ask that question? <laughs> it's like asking a gambler if he'll ever gamble again, or an alcoholic if he'll ever have a sip of alcohol again, or a drug addict who who who, who won't go for that booger sugar. I mean, come on. Why, why'd you ask that question? I wonder how many twos will be in the chat. I wonder. I wonder. But D.C., and the EU foreign policymakers actually wanted nothing more than prolonging this war for as long as possible, only to now have to force Zelensky to beg Russia to be satisfied with keeping 20% of Ukraine in exchange for ending the war. Now let's talk about it. Let's go a little bit further here. Let's talk about what's going on. And just to trigger, just to trigger the vote blue, no matter who people from RT, Ukraine is losing. So what now? The stated aim for the much-hyped Ukrainian counterfence was to inflict a major strategic defeat on Russia by cutting off the land corridor to Crimea. But hardly anyone in the Western media and political establishment with any real knowledge believed that Kiev would be able to achieve such a result. So many people died. P people died. They're, they're not coming back. That's, that's the thing. Now, I don't know what happens in the afterlife. May maybe there is a heaven. Maybe there is a hell. Or is it, I don't know, shocking. There, there might be not be anything on the other side at all. Life is short and precious, and we're only here once, and then that's it. We're gone. So many people died for no reason. One big waste. And this, and the real horrific truth, and I've, I've repeated it before, if clearer heads were in the room, the world would be different probably. Not better, but it'd be just a little bit different. Maybe there would be one less conflict. It could have been avoided. It it could have been avoided. Going on, continuing on, the key is that uh, it would have been strange to expect otherwise. Throughout the war, the Ukrainians have never managed to break through prepared defenses of Russian troops. The Karov offense in September of 2022 was conducted against an extremely small and stretched Russian force with no serious fortica fortification system. The Kiros region pushed in August through November of 2022, but also carried out against depleted and overstretched defenders, but resulted in only limited advances with heavy casualties until the threat of the destruction of the Denver River crossings forced the Russians to retreat to the left bank. Given this, it seems strange to expect the Ukrainians to succeed under new conditions that prevailed by the summer of this year. The numerical balance of forces had shifted in Moscow's favor. The Russian defense line was well equipped and fortified, and the mobilization of domestic industry was also beginning to show results. So the aim of the counteroffense was not to defeat Russian forces, but to gain access to the Sea of Azov, but rather to force Moscow to negotiate on terms favorable to the West. This required, firstly, demonstrating that Kiev retained the strategic initiative, secondly, inflicting heavy losses on the Russian army, which would destabilize the situation inside the country, and thirdly, making some headway so as to be able to claim a form of victory, which didn't happen whatsoever. 
It didn't happen whatsoever. All of this, this war, this end conclusion, nothing changed. Lives lost. The counteroffense. Yes, did it gain some ground? Yeah. But not to shift the balance. Heaven forbid this war still, still continues on. But when you have your leader acting like this on national television, begging for money, this 10-second clip, pure gold. Gone is the confidence. Hey, Sean Penn, I hate to tell this to you, but I think your Academy Award was uh, pawned off. If you can't give us, can't give us some financial support, okay, okay, please give us a credit, and we will give you back money. Oh, all the needless censorship and suppression, all the needless waste, because of what, what Russia Gate, because of how 2016 played out. And the aftermath of 2016, it wasn't just only Russiagate, but the ongoing censorship and everyone thinking that they know better what's right and what's wrong. All what it did is contribute further divides, keeping us in our own corners. And nothing has changed. And we have to be aware of the game that's being played. The system is designed to lie to you and keep you in the dark. Wake up. Or someday... We're going to see another war and have another leader do this again. If you can't give us, can't give us some financial support, okay, okay, please give us a credit and we will give you back money.